Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. It's a blank uh, slide, but we can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was just a test slide. Ah, there we yes. go. Perfect. Excellent. One second. I'm just trying to, ah, yes, okay. Now I can also see it. Okay, so, yes. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, for this great opportunity because uh, it is uh, so nice to how technology has transformed all of us. And I think future will be great for all of us uh, going now. So. Thank you, but Tyron. Yes. So don't be surprised by this slide. The topic is still functioning muscle transfer. So when this such patients come to us, of course, these are very rare injuries. When they come to us, the first question they ask is whether the hand will ever be functional. And Go past that, that's his x-ray. So it's, an, it's like we call it as a sleeve. Oh, I'm so that's the post debridement picture. And uh, we replanted it repaired all the nerves and then uh, we just put all the soft tissue together and just skin grafted it at 48 hours. Once the graft settles down, we go ahead and then replace the volar skin for access in future. And for this, we use a pedicle flap. The reason why we use pedicle flap is whenever we require a, a free flap in future for any secondary microsurgical reconstruction, our first uh, choice for flap cover is a pedicle flap. And we are, it's quite easy to do, quite fast. We just make the patient lie on the lateral position, just raise the flap, and we even discharge the patient in third or fourth post-op day. They are very comfortable, they can walk around, and they get admitted for flap division. So this is at six months. By this time, he has got tenal sign uh, reaching his uh, distal palmar crease. At this stage, there is some amount of thinner recovery also, and we go in for a functioning muscle transfer. And that's a skin island. We tend to take our muscle transfers with skin island. And that's a function. This is a function which is at one year follow up. And uh, of course, he's from a uh, distant uh, another uh, state. So he is not followed up after that. But I'm sure definitely he would have improved much, much more after this. So this kind of surgery is what made our hospital very popular in the local region. And as we were just discussing, once we have the new upgradation of our hospital with a new block, we will be having a combined strength of 750 beds uh, with uh, 44 operation theaters dedicated only for plastic and reconstructive surgery and orthopedic trauma reconstruction. So this has been our last year's statistics. Most of these have been uh, trauma and trauma related. Of course, close to one third have been non-traumatic, which is uh, burns lower extremity diabetic foot but if you see here majority of our trauma also involves a lot of micro work and this includes both for trauma as well as for brachial plexus reconstruction and this is our current status we have 10 consultants uh, what you call as attending in us and five registrars and 24 re residents of which we have four residents for plastic and four for hand and microsurgery who are orthopedic background every year and this is our brachial plexus team, as most of these surgery today being functioning muscle transfer will be uh, part of brachial plexus. And Dr. Praveen on the extreme left uh, is the one who does all our orthopedic part, that is wrist fusion, trapezius transfers, shoulder fusions, and all the secondary procedures. And uh, Dr. Sabapati, our chief. And so we have a, a good team and uh, we combine and do all the cases most of the time together. And our center, because of the high volume, has been a center now sought after for trainees to come. Now, coming to the topic of the day, which is functioning muscle transfer, and we were just writing a chapter on it in the, for VIC. And the first reported uh, case was in 1970, and it was a rectus femoris muscle. And there is a report from China that is in 1973, but that does not have any authors and does not have the unit. So it was basically done for Hochman's ischemic contracture. And surprisingly, they had taken the lateral half of the pectoralis major based on the uh, lateral pectoral nerve. 
<coughs> and the thoracacal middle vessels and that's a very interesting paper and ikuda did for the first time for the vic in japan so if you see most of the history there goes back to my nearly 50 years 50 to 60 years and it has been predominantly been by the japanese the chinese and the uh, the taiwan and the uh, korean surgeons at that time and subsequently of course professor manklo from canada and uh, uh, and from us from the urbania unit as you are all aware and uh, the, the, it it was taken up in a large way but we were little late to start functioning muscle transfer in our unit and the reason being of course we did not get so much of major uh, brachial plexus trauma at that time and also because dr sababadi was well trained in doing tendon transfers so our threshold of doing uh, functioning muscle transfers was not uh, very low we we used to uh, explore all other options including a pedicle ld we have done for finger flexion before uh, going for a functioning muscle transfer so this has been our sort of 15 year experience and if you see here most of them have been done for elbow flexion and of these majority have been for brachial plexus so 104 cases for elbow flexion predominantly has been for adult brachial plexus rarely for the children and because children we do have some options of uh, pedicle trapezius transfer or many other tendon transfer options left so unless there is a totally flail limb and uh, which needs re uh, reinnervating or repowering that we use a functioning muscle transfer but the next chunk which is actually increasing in number and this has been very recent numbers and that has been for finger flexion especially post replantation and post vocalization and contraction our protocol for functioning muscle transfer basically we wait for one year in case of global palsy and in case of post neurotization failure and this has been cases from other units which have they have done a, a nerve transfer but has not worked or has been just grade 1 or grade 2 power then we go ahead anything less than grade m m mrc grade 2 we consider it as a failure it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, especially for elbow flexion and for obstetric palsy and the last two being movement systemic contracture and major replantation so today i won't be covering facial palsy i will be covering these four areas mainly for elbow flexion finger flexion finger flexion for brachial plexus and for trauma and vocalization contract so this will be the most important indications in any busy unit which does a lot of trauma and also brachial plexus so before we do a functioning muscle transfer these are the four requirements ideally we should have and it's not possible in all cases but having a full range of passive range of movement is must because if there are contractures around the shoulder or there is a fixed flexion contracture around the elbow like a myositis ossificans those things should be taken care of before we embark on a functioning muscle transfer there should not be any scar tissue as in the case i presented if you are passing the muscle through the forearm you should ideally have a good pliable soft tissue so if there is scar tissue then first step should be to replace you can combine a functioning muscle transfer with a flap but in our experience and with our uh, uh, we we are here sort of we don't want to take a chance if the flap fails then you have a failure of flap as well as for the functioning muscle transfer it is nice to have good sensation and some amount of intrinsic function so that is very important and uh, the advantage of gracilis we have only done one case of rectus femoris which was associated with a alt flap but other than that all these cases 168 cases have been predominantly uh, gracilis muscle and the reason being gracilis is a very nice muscle and it has, we have done close to 1700 gracilis for trauma so we are very conversant with the anatomy very classic anatomy there is no variations there is no functional deficit with a reliable skin paddle and i'll also show a short video how we make it more reliable and it can be done simultaneously as a two team approach so once you take a gracilis or once you are very conversant taking a harvesting a gracilis this is a fantastic flap it can cover from head to toe it can cover for functioning muscle transfers for facial palsies for for uh, free uh, in case of upper limb also so the way we harvest is first step is we mark the adductor longus however obese a person is we can always palpate the tendon of the adductor longus we draw a straight line and once you have marked the adductor longus 
two finger breadth below the adductor longus is a gracilis. So that's a gracilis. Gracilis is always much more posterior to what we think it is. So the common tendency or the mistake people do is they, they put the incision a little higher up. And see, the, the moment you put this incision, the only muscle you can see is gracilis. Distally, you will find the sartorius, but that's quite distal. And you just cannot get confused with any other muscle in this area. The pedicle is around 8 to 10 centimeters from the inguinal ligament. So that is the pedicle and that's a key step and that's what we need to keep in mind. Most of the time we do with a skin island, but in case of a very obese patient and if you think the thigh is very bulky, you can go without a skin island or we, we also do without skin island. In that case, we keep the uh, part of the muscle exposed, don't close it and then come back after 48 or 72 hours and do a secondary closure the skin island just like in free fibula the skin island of the fibula was also considered not reliable till which and we just stepped in and uh, now we know it's very reliable so similarly the skin island was not reliable because we were tending to position the skin island a little lower down and more posterior the skin island actually survives on the perforators coming from this uh, the uh, gracilis pedicle through the intermuscular septum between the adductor longus and the gracilis. So that's the this septum we need to maintain. So that's the adductor longus which has been retracted. Gracilis is below. That's the main pedicle. And if you see the number of perforators which is coming. So this septum we need to maintain. So this is a, uh, just a video. I just uh, made it a little fast. But you can, all the steps are there. So we mark the island. That's the pedicle. That's a nerve. And that's the length of the muscle we are going to harvest. In an adult, the length of the gracilis is roughly 40 centimeters and uh, in a in the exact distance between the clavicle and the biceps is also 40 centimeters we just make these small hatch marks so that we can closure becomes easy because once we have harvested sometimes positioning the, the closure becomes a little difficult distally there is hardly anything sometimes you can have a second or a third minor pedicle but then most of the time distally you are just separating it from the sartorius but once you come proximally, first you will encounter is a minor pedicle. It is always nice to clip the pedicle and not use cautery because sometimes when you use cautery, it can transmit along the pedicle and cause a small area of necrosis on the muscle. Then we go to the anterior incision. Here we see the, the saphenous vein. As I said, we have to be behind the saphenous vein or posterior to it. You safeguard the saphenous vein because most of the lymphatics, they will go along the saphenous vein. So that's a saphenous vein here. There is always one branch which comes from the saphenous vein for the skin island. There are papers which they have used it as a second draining vein. So once you put the incision on the adductor longus and just push everything down, you start seeing the pedicle. So that's a pedicle. That's a small branch which goes to the adductor longus, branch of the obturator now. The muscle below the adductor longus is the brevis and the broad muscle uh, posteriorly is the adductor minus. So once you have done this, the only important step to remember is to ligate the branches going to the adductor longus carefully because this is a very key step. If your clip slips or if you have any problem here, then it will have a torrential bleed once you take it to the axilla or the arm. So there harvesting, uh, arresting the bleeding is much more difficult. So once you have done that, then only we put this posterior incision because till that time, the skin island is safe. The moment you have put the circumferential skin incision, we anchor the skin to the muscle because it should not get accidentally sheared. Then we mark the muscle at three centimeter distance. Normally mentioned in the books is five centimeters, but we prefer three centimeters because most of the time what happens is most of this muscle which is buried, which goes into the tunnel. So you may miss the muscle. You will miss the marking. So as I said, this skin island will get sutured to the axilla or the arm. And then this part from the distal edge of the skin island to this tendinous part usually is buried. So most of the time you need to take only measurement rather than marking the muscle. Marking the muscle is only useful when we do for Volkmann's ischemic contracture in the forearm where everything is open and then you can pull. The basic idea is you need to bring the muscle back to its resting length because a 40 centimeter muscle, the moment you divide it, so that's a nerve. So the moment you divide the tendon distally, you will find it will reduce by close to around 10 centimeters. So 40, 40 centimeter gracilis 
becomes close to around 28 to 30, 30 centimeters. So because we have measured it preoperatively, and we have also measured from the clavicle to the biceps tendon and the extra length which is needed to weave it, we know exactly how much we have to stretch it back to its original length. So that's what we need to keep in mind. Now coming to the steps of the, uh, the surgery, the first step is isolating the donor nerve. So this is most important because the whole success of surgery of a functioning muscle transfer is based on the donor nerve. Stronger the donor nerve, better it is. So spinal accessory is one of the best donor nerves. Phrenic is very good, but because of the problems and complications of phrenic nerve, we don't use phrenic in our department, but many units use it. Even Professor Doy has started using phrenic now. The second choice is intercostal nerve. The choice one and two are basically in a global palsy. Sometimes there are partial palsy. There is some recovery of medial pectoral, that is pectoral uh, muscle, or the lat dorsi, the thoracodorsal nerve. So in those cases, we can take these two also. Surprisingly, you'll find that even though functionally the muscle is grade two or grade three, that means the thoracodorsal is weak for a transfer as a pedicle transfer. But if you use that nerve for a nerve transfer or for as, a, as our donor nerve, it gives a good result. That is very, very interesting finding which we have found. Median and ulnar nerve we use basically for post workman's ischemic contraction and following trauma. And nerve to brachialis is exclusively used for restoring the finger, uh, the elbow, uh, the finger flexion in case of birth palsies, because they recover the C5, C6, but there is distal uh, muscles are paralyzed. Posterior interstitial now we have used only once, but it is a very good now if you have finger loss or finger extension, because the indication is very less. Because most of the time you will have some tendons like FCU or FCR or some tendons available for transfer. Now coming to the fixation, the bony fixation. So the choices are clavicle, the coracoid process, second rib, that's here, and the humerus in case of forearm. Why we need to do it to the humerus and not the epicondyle in most of the cases is, in case of forearm trauma, most of the time we have shortened the forearm. And when we have shortened the forearm, the forearm becomes short, the gracilis becomes very long. And you cannot, you need the entire tendon for the gliding and for the uh, weaving in the uh, distal part. So we need to shift the gracilis muscle a little higher up. Coming to the clavicle fixation. So we fix it to the clavicle. You can do it two ways. And this is what we were doing before. This is also okay, but not as good as the next uh, technique, which we now follow. Here, what we do is we attach it to the, the, the lateral half of the pectoralis major. So as the tendinous fibers of the pectoralis major take origin from the clavicle, you can directly insert it onto that because it is difficult to take a bite through the periosteum of the clavicle. You can go all around the clavicle also, but this is one technique. And this, once you fix it, we don't tend to go more medially. You need to stick to laterally because for two reasons. One, the nerve will reach comfortably. Second is if you place the insertion more medially, when they flex, it will go for more medial uh, internal rotation rather than coming out. So that's also functionally not great. So now this is what we do. We totally expose the clavicle make two drill holes using K wires, 1.5 millimeter K wires. And once we have taken the drill, uh, drill holes, we pass the suture. We use one uh, PDS suture right uh, currently. So we pass the suture through through, and this is kept ready as we, uh, everything is kept ready. Once the muscle is uh, divided, then it's like a race against time. We try to keep a ischemia time of one hour. So that's our target but we usually tend to uh, be within one hour with around 45 minutes to one hour. So that's very important. Fixing to the rib, and uh, this is also a very interesting technique. This I learned from Dr. Sabapati. And you use the same PDS needle, the sharp edge is towards facing you. The blunt end, you just go hugging the rib and this, just come out to the other side. And this way you have a snug fit around the entire second rib. And this is really rigid and you just cannot slip from this fixation. So this is one of the best ways of fixing uh, when you fix it to the second rib. Humerus, we follow the same technique. We make two drill holes and then take the suture through it. Distally, the tendon is waved. We need to have at least eight to 10 centimeters of the tendon to go multiple times along the distal uh, biceps tendon. So we go as distal as possible and start weaving it from the length. It starts becoming a tendon in the gracilis. The proximal muscle is placed on the, on the biceps and if you want temporarily, you can take a couple of 
uh, vital sutures so that just to keep in place which will dissolve after some time coming to the vascular anastomosis so vascular anastomosis will depend on where you fix and what nerve you take so if you are taking the thorac thoracoacromial you need to fix it to the clavicle and spinal accessory is your donor if you are fixing to the coracoid process and using intercostal as your donor then or a medial pectoral then you need to use the thoracodorsal vessels if you are going more distally circumflex humeral then it is also can be used uh, in case of intercostal nerve transfer but when you are fixing to the humerus we tend to use the brachial vessels into side or sometimes if you are lucky you will get some branch here which you can use and when we come to the forearm when you are fixed to the medial epicondyle or lateral epicondyle rarely in case of posterior interosseous now as a donor then we use the radial artery branches and especially the recurrent branches they are very big size and you can use that or you can use it end to side to either brachial artery or radial nerve positioning is very important so when you position the patient the axilla of the patient should actually lie on your hand table and the patient should be like diagonally shifted so that the head rests on the operation table but the axilla comes exactly on to your operate on to your hand table because if it doesn't come then they are doing your anastomosis especially to thoracoacromial and the thoracodorsal in the axilla can be very difficult usually the assistant cannot see through the other side so he wears the loop and then he assists through the loops the another person can see through this and can can help you but the lead assistant usually sits uh, by the side coming to the access for thoracoacromial so it is very important to know the anatomy at this level so these are the two heads of the pectoral is major that's a deltopectoral groove and that's the cephalic vein in the deltopectoral groove this is the lateral uh, the clavicular part of pec major and that's a sternal head of the pec major so we need to go between the two heads of the pec major usually there will be a nice line this is called the gray line and once you go through that line you will bang hit the thoracoacromial vessels there is some fibro fatty tissues some fat here which we need to carefully excise it off once you do that you fix it to the clavicle it will nicely comfortably reach the spinal accessory we take the middle finger fds as our graft most of the time when you are doing for finger flexors we tend to take a graft because then we can weave it very nicely distally so that's the the all the fdps are taken together we don't put it to the thumb the thumb usually is uh, fused the cmc joint is fused and in this case most of the time before we do for finger flexors we also fuse the wrist joint you need to see we use the fcu as our pulley and you need to see the entire excursion of the muscle through the entire uh, joint and the elbow extension and flexion it should not snap here and this is the same patient this is how they start physiotherapy and then they start strengthening exercises so that's the thoracoacromial and that's the thoracodorsal when we take anastomosis to the thoracodorsal the muscle tends to uh, fall on the vessels so you need to take a bite reflecting the gracilis onto the the intercostal muscles here so that once you do the anastomosis you release the stitch and the muscle flips back into its position otherwise once you do this it will continuously keep uh, dropping onto the vessels so how do we harvest the intercostal nerves and uh, of course i have we have videos of all the procedures so if anyone is interested we can uh, give them all the videos with voice over and we raise the flap with the pectoral is major that's it thoracodorsal uh, thoracodorsal vessels harvested we put a use a bovi and directly go to the rib raise the periosteum along with the the muscles and then use a periosteal elevator to raise it it is always nice to harvest or access the intercostal nerves more medially first and then go laterally because if you start from lateral there will be branches and it is much more deeper so you need to go right up to the uh, costochondral junction and once you reach the costochondral junction that's a costochondral junction here and then you go under the rib and here also there is a small technique you can put actually a drill hole under the rib and then take a bite and pull it but we usually use this uh, rake forceps see once we identify it we uh, stimulate it and see and then you can go uh, more laterally the lateral mode most extent is up to the origin of the uh, serratus anterior so we don't go beyond the serratus anterior the muscle is brought into place the anastomosis is done because ischemia time is crucial and then we tend to take when we use intercostal nerves we usually put glue otherwise we always uh, take sutures 
Here also we take a couple of sutures and then put glue on top. So this is how it will look like after the end of the anastomosis and the repair of the vessels. And once we have done this, we release this bite so that it is now comfortable and it will come in place. And then we extend the tendon with the tendon graft. So something it will look like this. Position of the elbow should be 100 degrees of flexion. So little more flexion than what you need and has to be strictly immobilized for at least three weeks. So what we do is initial two weeks, we give a slab. We give a full uh, like a spike up and uh, not going all around the elbow, but like we give for burn contracture releases. And then we convert it to this splint up to 14 days. And this splint is strictly maintained for another three weeks. So at around six weeks, they remove the splint and just convert it to a above elbow a thermoplastic splint. Nerve stimulation, we start at four weeks. And that's very important because if you start stimulation earlier, there is a rupture of the uh, nerve cooperation site because the muscle will start getting stimulated and muscle can have violent contracture. So this is an example. When we use the uh, thoracodorsal vessels here, in this case, we have used the intercostal muscles. This is what they'll get. In late presentation, we, as I said, we wait for one year. And if uh, anybody presenting beyond one year, uh, then we straight away go for functioning muscle transfer. We don't go for any nerve transfers. So in this case, we have used the intercostal. And whenever we have take, used the intercostal, the first uh, uh, change, how do we assess them? So first, they will get some squeeze pain. When you squeeze the skin island of the uh, gracilis, they will get pain. So that's the first sign. Or you can do an EMG also. We don't usually tend to do an EMG for the extra cost. So once they start getting squeeze pain, that is the time we start them uh, on more aggressive physiotherapy or what is called as an induction exercise. So they need to strengthen their intercostal muscles and the intercostal nerve. So the donor now has to be strengthened. So that's what is called as an induction exercise. And then once they get visible flicker, then we, we start more aggressive physiotherapy. And the moment they start getting some anti-gravity biceps as seen here, we immediately go in and do a wrist fusion. By doing a wrist fusion, there is a paper by Professor Doy. They have found even the DASH score improves just by doing a wrist fusion because now it has become like a one unit and the entire shoulder is stabilized with this biceps. We have not done anything for the shoulder. Actually, they do get some amount of shoulder abduction also. In upper plexus, with late presentation where we have done, we use the median nerve as our donor. And here the recovery comes very fast. So we start them on uh, exercises much earlier. Finger flexion recovery is the, the challenge and this is a very nice landmark paper from the Mayo Clinic and they have done all kinds of reconstruction and they have also found that rudimentary grasp is only what we can achieve with a functioning muscle transfer and especially if you take one muscle for two functions then the outcome is much uh, poorer. And the Mayo Clinic has sort of modified the classical DOI in classic DOI, he does for elbow flexion and wrist extension, whereas the Mayo Clinic prefers to do for elbow flexion and finger flexion with one gracilis. They also, along with this, innervate the, uh, the biceps by doing an intercostal to biceps transfer. So you get double advantage, one through the intercostal and one from the, uh, the free functioning muscle transfer. What do our patients want? 90% of our patients of Blake and Plexus have been two-wheeler accidents. And uh, surprisingly, the only thing they want is go back and drive a bike. Then this is not for basically sport, it's for their livelihood. So that is the reason why they need to get <clears throat> back to work. And we have found that for getting that, we need to have a shape, stable shoulder, a good elbow, stable wrist, and some finger flexion. So we thought out of the box, and this idea came from actually Spider-Man. One day we were watching, I was watching Spider-Man and the way he was climbing. And then we thought if we incorporate the magnets in the volar side of the wrist and the forearm, mainly in the palm, then they can grasp objects. So at a stage where the wrist has been fused, nothing has been done to the hand. It's a flail limb. You see, just by putting this glove, he can, he can hold a glass, he can drink, they can even drive a bike because we made a, a sleeve for the motorbike, sleeve for the car, sleeve for holding things. So this is just by doing this. So now what we have done, if they are willing for functioning muscle transfer, we start them on this. They start doing, there is a good range of physiotherapy is possible by wearing, just by wearing this glove and doing day-to-day -day And then we go for uh, functioning muscle transfer for the finger flexion. 
So achieving elbow flexion is now easily possible by various techniques, by direct nerve transfer, as in this case, or by functioning muscle transfer. Achieving finger flexion is the challenge. So in this patient, we have used the intercostals, and then we have done the functioning muscle transfer for finger flexion. So once they get anti-gravity biceps, we go ahead and do this. And as I said, we use the intercostals for our functioning muscle transfer. So spinal accessory to muscular cutaneous will bring from here to here. They get very strong elbow flexion, but the hand is supinated and the fingers are flay and the wrist is flay. So at this stage, what we do, we do a trapezius transfer. Even though we have harvested the spinal accessory, still the upper trapezius is innervated because we don't take the branches going to the upper trapezius. The lower trapezius does get, gets paralyzed. So upper trapezius can give them up to 30 degrees of abduction, fuse the wrist, and then we start very vigorous range of physiotherapy with the glove. And once they are reached that stage, we do the functioning muscle transfer for the finger flexion using the intercostal. And they do get very good power. The only problem is they don't have finger extension. So I will come in the subsequent slide what we have thought for that also. But then most of the time, many, many people who have not done this or uh, seen patients who have reached this stage always ask the question, is this function useful? And what can a patient do with what he has got? And they feel that this is not a very useful function. So we just made this video of most of the things in a DASH score. And surprisingly, you will find at this stage, when we do a DASH for them, it is quite low. It comes in the range of 20 to 30 because they can wear a clothing, they can open a door, they can drive a vehicle, they can drag things, they can lift. Once they get more power, they can lift a lightweight uh, chair, they can push chair or a table, which is easily possible. And then they can drive, drive a bicycle comfortably. So here you see the biceps has recovered from nerve transfer, the wrist has been fused, and the fingers are what we have done is the functioning muscle transfer for the fingers. Can we do it for subclavian artery injury? Yes, we can, but we need to know the collateral, how do they develop? So most of the time we have to do an angiogram before and the collaterals develop from the backside. So here is a patient who has undergone spinal uh, functioning muscle transfer for the elbow. And once we reach uh, that stage here, we cannot do another muscle transfer because we already used one valuable donor for the first free functioning. So what we do, we, we connect the biceps tendon to the finger flexors. And this has been described by Professor Oberlin uh, a long time back. And he can lift a, big, a full laptop bag, sorry for the, and he can drive a cycle. So what we do basically is, when we have done a nerve transfer and the biceps has recovered, we detach the entire biceps tendon, extend it with a facial autograph and fix it to the FTP tendon. In case where we have done a functioning muscle transfer, we do it in continuity. So this is how it is. So this is the flexion. So we have made a glove now for extending the fingers. So there are straps which go on the dorsum, fixed to the wrist. So he's able to flex. Flexion is done voluntarily, forcefully. And once he relaxes, it just extends the fingers. Coming to finger flexion, uh, for elbow flexion in birth palsies, in this case, we can do using the brachialis branch. This is for finger flexion. So we have used the brachialis branch, fixed it to the humerus, and they can get reasonably good function. Here, the advantage they have is that they do have some amount of uh, finger extension by the intrinsic action. So that makes their finger open up. Coming to the last two parts, that's a Bokman's ischemic contracture. Severe Bokman's ischemic contracture does not have any tendons available for transfer. So it is done in two stages, or maybe three, depending on the skin condition. First stage is excision of the infected tendon and a neurolysis. Then the second stage is a, a flap cover if there is soft tissue shortage, or we directly go for functioning muscle transfer if the nerves are intact and good. If the nerves are not good, then we need to do nerve grafting, which can be done at this stage or can be done in another uh, in a previous stage. So at this stage, we do a functioning muscle transfer. We take the skin island. We tend not to put skin graft. So if there is a need for skin graft, now we prefer to do a good abdominal flap or some flap cover before. We don't connect it to the thumb. We fuse the CMC joint of the thumb. And that is a good uh, position to fuse the thumb. And uh, you'll get a good outcome. So this is a small boy who is an eight-year-old boy. We see that's how he presents to us because of tight bandaging. So we have some amount of native bandaging which is done. So they go to a bone setter. So that's uh, 
outcome. This is the outcome you see after the intrinsic uh, recovery following neurolysis. So neurolysis itself gives good intrinsic recovery. And once they reach this stage and have sensation, some sensation up to the mid palm or the progressive tinnel sign, only after that we go ahead and do a functioning muscle transfer. So that's the functioning muscle transfer. And that's how we identify the nerve. So whichever nerve is recovered more, so we tend to sort of neuralize it again, release it. And we are trying to take a big chunk. It is very difficult to identify anterior intraocular nerve as described in the textbooks. So we just don't hesitate to take a big chunk of median nerve with our experience of overlain transfer. We know that even if we take a big uh, part of the median nerve, you will get a good outcome and not distal deficit. And that's his outcome. Unfortunately, he has a tendency for keloid, so he's given rise to a scar. In this case, as I mentioned before, here you should not put a skin graft. Always go for a flap cover because that is uh, very important for our functioning muscle transfer in the next stage. So how do we adjust the tension? We take all the FTP tendons and the tension is more on the little finger. We try to replicate the casket and take at least two bytes of proline 30 going across. And this forms a one big unit. And then we insert the entire restless tendon into the FTP of all fingers. Here is another example where there is severe wokeness ischemic contracture. So first step, we have done abdominal flap. So we need to have a good uh, soft tissue cover. In the second step here, he has loss in the median and ulnar now. So here we cannot wait for the intrinsic recovery because it's a long segment loss. So we have combined the nerve grafting with the functioning muscle transfer. And uh, do the functioning muscle transfer results come actually earlier than the intrinsic recovery and the sensation in this case. But then eventually they will get good sensory recovery also. So we analyzed 22 cases and that was our outcome. Most of them fell in the uh, grade of M3 plus and M4. And uh, of these 20 were put to the median now and two to the ulnar now. And that the neurolysis was done in 15. Flap cover was needed in six. And even sensory recovery was very good, especially after the neurolysis. And of course, when we do a nerve grafting, it is much uh, less than optimal. The way we outcome, we analyze the outcome is by the device modification, which is a classic MRC grade, but also takes into consideration the range of movement. So anything less than 30 degrees of full range of movement is M3, 60 degrees is M4, and more than 90 degrees of full range is M5. And of course, the ability to lift at least five kgs is M5. So that is the outcome in our cases of workman's ischemic contraction. Severe, severe VIC and four shortening of the, in this case, the forearm and a fixed flexion deformity at the elbow. So in these cases, they usually tend, even though we have taken the gristle is really higher up, as they had mentioned before, there is shortening of the forearm. So we need to go in and do a tenolysis. So this is a tenolysis done. We usually tend to wait for at least six months before doing a tenolysis, but rarely you will need to do this. In this case, there are two factors. One is the elbow contracture and there is shortage of skin in the forearm, but improved finger flexion comes after the uh, tenolysis. And sometimes the intrinsic will not recover as in the case which I presented before. Here is another boy. So after you do a functioning muscle transfer, they get good finger flexion but there is no intrinsic or there is still clawing and loss of opposition. So you can do subsequent claw correction in opponent's plastic. So this has been done in this patient and that can improve your hand function. So it is very important whenever you do functioning muscle transfer, it is just not microsurgery. You need to be sort of conversant with all kinds of hand surgical reconstruction. The last part of this presentation is for major replantation. Most of the time in our 160 to 170 major crush uh, major replantations, we have had only four clean concolitin amputation proximal to the wrist. Other than that, most of them have been either avulsion or crush avulsion. So in this situation, we will always have loss of finger flexors. The flexor compartment will be totally lost. So in this patient, as you see here, once the bones unite and once they get some amount of uh, first step is to restore the elbow flexion. Here we have done using the pectoralis major, a Clark's transfer. And then we wait for the thinner recovery. Once the thinner muscles recover, we do the functioning muscle transfer. And in this case, we have used the ulnar now because the median now was uh, repaired and the ulnar was not fully repaired. So we use the ulnar now. And in this case, this is a multi-level injury. So first step is debride thoroughly. Any injury distal to the, uh, very close to the wrist and around the wrist, 
uh, we tend to do a primary rich fusion and that was done here after the uh, bones go for good union at six months and there is some amount of uh, recovery of sensation and intrinsics we then do the next day in this case as you see here this was skin grafted so we are replaced with the abdominal flap and once the flap settles and there is a recovery of intrinsics we have done a functioning muscle transfer as a third stage and here the tendons are very distal it's in the palm so we need to get an extra length and even though it is at the palm it gives a good outcome and this is uh, this is uh, she's able to lift uh, nearly five kgs of weight finally only one case we have done for uh, extensor uh, for finger extension as i said the indication is very rare you need to have a patient where the entire flexor compartment is severely injured as well as complete loss of the extensor exp uh, extensor compartment so in this patient this we published as a rare case of severe mutilated injury so first step actually we ended up doing a flow through alt free flap to salvage the limb and once the flap settled well we were able to get because of shortening some amount of proximal flexor tendons so the flexion flexion recovered and then we use the functioning muscle transfer co-opted to the posterior interruptions now and that's for the finger extension here again we took the skin island and it actually came more volar it has to be done in full extension keeping the wrist and the mp joint uh, in extension and the fingers fully flexed so that's the flexion and you see here down the action side that's a functioning muscle transfer which is giving rise to the finger extension so this is we analyze if you see here this is the five cases which analyze more than one year follow up and uh, three of them were in the m4 category so to conclude it's an extremely rewarding surgery good anatomical knowledge is very important and of, of course taking care of the secondary reconstruction is also very important gracilis is an excellent choice the only thing is we tend to tell our trainees more gracilis you do for trauma more you will be happy to do it for functioning muscle transfer i always find that people who are don't do more of gracilis for trauma tend not to do it for functioning muscle transfer post operative physiotherapy and supervised therapy is very important to conclude it is it's not what what the patient does is basically what the patient does with what you have given him so most of the time as surgeons we ourselves are very pessimistic that this may not work and this will not give rise to good outcome but this patient is extremely happy is the same patient with the supplement artery injury he actually invited me for this wedding but because of lockdown just before that i could not attend the wedding but this is a photograph i show to all my regular basis patients that you have a future in front of you so don't need to get disappointed thank you very much Great. Thank you so much, Hari. That was uh, truly a, a tour de force. And um, I think everyone on the team can see why I really wanted Hari to give a talk. Um, one, uh, one visit to Ganga Hospital, uh, within a day or so, you're, um, you realize that, that, that this is really an incredible place with a lot of um, uh, tremendous volume, perhaps even one of the largest in the world. So I think for anyone who is interested in hand trauma, uh, peripheral nerve surgery, plexus surgery, um, a little bit yes. of re reconstruction. I think Ganga Hospital is a place you should definitely visit. Um, so I want to open up um, sure. the floor, if you will, uh, for questions. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll start just to give people a chance to uh, open up their mic. Um, so having seen your clinic, Hari, um, it's incredible how far patients travel uh, to get to you. Yes. And um, in, light, in light of the fact that these injuries require a lot of physical therapy and hand therapy, uh, can you share with us how you guys uh, coordinate that and, and, and how you're able to get these patients? Yes, so what we do is uh, most of the patients, actually, we keep them in-house for nearly 10 days to two weeks. We don't discharge them. That's the first thing. They, we mobilize them around 10th day, and we do a suture removal and put on the slab. Uh, we just give them some sedation and remove the sutures and the first dressing under some kind of anesthesia. After that, what we do is we have a, a full protocol. So we have made a video of the protocol. And what we do is we, we shoot a video with the patient. So we, we give them nerve stimulator. So we have an in-house nerve stimulator, which costs around $70. And we have, we have made a chart where to give them, how much to give, where to give. And we teach patient as well as two of his relatives or fellows who will be along with him. Mm -hmm. Once he goes, wherever he goes, and uh, wherever he goes, we ask them, whoever is the referring doctor or the neighborhood physiotherapist. 
or the therapist. They may not be hand therapist, but there will be some uh, other therapist or physiotherapist basically taking care of orthopedic trauma. So we tell them to get in touch with us. Now with WhatsApp and with uh, networking is so easy and we, we can teach them online uh, how to do it. And actually that was part of my presentation in the ASSH yeah. using uh, internet as your uh, follow up and for so uh, in fact most of the videos which I have also put here patients send them by WhatsApp uh, mm -hmm. or by online uh, by video share WeChat they send the videos post operative results. So that's how we monitor them. We can monitor actually you can monitor anybody anywhere in the world now. That's yeah. not difficult. Great. Th thanks for that. <laughs> I have a quick question. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful set of cases and ideas and and actually different ideas than we think of here. One of them had to do with um, we used to put and for a while we found that we were not uh, we were actually needed to stretch. and we're actually stretching things out. Have you found that to be true? Do you feel like, uh, I, I always feel like we can put these things in a little bit tighter than we think. Have you ever had anybody too tight? Actually, we have not had too tight. There's always been more lax. You can never be too tight because yeah. uh, we are fixing it to the clavicle bony fixation and distally also we are uh, fixing very rigidly to the, very strongly to the, uh, by pulvert up to the tendon. So you can only become lax and during yeah. the period where the muscle is not uh, reanimated, which is around maybe around three, uh, six weeks to 12 weeks, that is the time they tend to relax. So that right. is the time they need to maintain the position very well because yeah. if they tend to do a passive stretching, once you stretch them, it will become lax. So they right. will not be able to get them. So very rarely we have overstretched it. It is only sort of under stretching because you are always very careful and you are scared. So you should not close your anastomosis till you have fixed it and sort of taken it in a in the basic range of movement. Because sometimes if you are too tight or if you pull it, then the muscle has become pale after you did the stretching or you pulled it and sutured it. So you should always keep your anastomosis open. But other than that, that's why we, we tend to take the overall length rather than yeah. the three centimeter because sure. as i showed most of our picture you saw the muscle is buried so it is buried from the axilla to the distal arm so all your marking is anyway is going to go inside you're not going to see the marking at all so you only see the skin island and you see the tendon so that is the reason why we we measure it so we measure from the clavicle to the amount of tendon part alone you stretch so you are in the correct length and the other thing had to do with uh, when you were putting in the gracilis for finger flexion, I didn't quite yes. understand what you were doing with the thumb, with FPL. So, so we don't do anything to the FPL. Basically, we are just fuse the CMC joint in functional position. So we I are see. basically intending the finger to come and meet the thumb. Okay. So that's what we do. In fact, in fact, the new concept which we have not done and Professor Dawai has started is to take the thumb push it out of the way of the fingers and fuse it. So it looks huh. very abnormal, but it will be fused in this position so that when the finger flexes, it doesn't go and hit the thumb. So that's how now they are fusing the thumb. So that's also so a good you're way. Not, you're not yes. trying to create any pinch whatsoever then? No pinch whatsoever because there is uh, nothing to power the thumb. There's nothing to power the thumb. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to do is we bring it as much abduction and try to keep little out of the way so that if he if he wants he can use it as a as a hook grip so pinch is only possible in walkmans it is possible because of the intrinsics and right. uh, and you have some other tendon so if you have extends the tendon some tendon available you can do a opponents plastic and restore their pinch so in walkman most of them get pinch but in global brachial flexes for finger flexion they won't get pinch and last quick question had to do with um, your first case, you put in nerve long nerve grafts and got some pretty good results, sensory results. How quickly do you put those nerve grafts in? Are they done emergently at the time of the injury or do you do it later? 
no we we never put nerve grafts in emergency the first case yeah. which i presented didn't have any nerve graft it was direct oh. repair the direct repair all replants we tend to do direct repair okay. if you are not able to get direct repair in the nerves in the replant major replant we bury them and take them away and keep them in a safe place and we come in again after 3 months once everything has settled down for doing the nerve graft so nerve graft okay. alone we don't do primarily because if anything goes wrong then you have lost a valuable uh, donor uh, agree yeah um Good. thank you I have a quick question hari um so yes. with regards to intercostal nerve transfers um i think most people you know use three nerves to coapt yes. to yes. the obturator um some some folks argue for more such as four for example based on the axon count no, no, no. some people do less like two do you have any experience yes. doing intercostal so, less than three or more than three and what are your thoughts on that so most of the people i have met and i have seen all the big brachial plexus surgeons either do two or three they do two only if they are using the intercostal for some other function mm -hmm. for example doy he takes for the functioning muscle transfer and also uses three intercostal for the triceps mm -hmm. or professor wong so he also does the same thing so if you are using for two purposes then you have less intercostal so you don't want to waste them so then you tend to take two for biceps but if you do only ffmt as one single procedure then traditionally everybody does three actually fitting three is itself very difficult beyond three is not possible yeah so three you put it you have to really take away all the soft tissue around mm -hmm. and push it inside and then drape it and then put a lot of glue around and then have so, you noticed uh, have you noticed a reduction in the motor capacity when using two intercostal nerves based on the reduced axon count actually we are not done two at all so i always tend to do three so maybe some people who have done two the uh, it is basically the people who do two they don't go more distal sometimes they tend to stay behind it's basically the size match so you go more by the eyeballing of the size match rather than the axon count so when you are little behind the size match is better you have more axons more distal you go that means more axons have been given away so that's the way you need to keep in mind so it's just like when we use a fascicle for oberlin we go by the size match yep. rather than the the this thing so got it um any other questions from the audience we have we have not done anything for sensation that's one question which can come up whether we put supraclavicular nerves or intercostal cutis branches we tend not to do it because it doesn't come but surprisingly in most of the patients you have done a gracilis for finger flexion once you stretch the fingers or they you squeeze the fingers they get pain on the chest wall so there is some amount of sensation which comes by itself uh, so they it's not that they are insensate we are yet to find a fellow who has got a functioning muscle transfer in his fingers and got them burnt of course they are also careful not that uh, but they have never complained of a uh, lack of sensation which is very surprising which we tend to always think that they need sensation yeah. because if they are very clear their finger ffmt for finger flexion is to give them a hook grip and to hold and manipulate and not for fine objects not for eating and writing they are very happy they they know that that's that's what they are undergoing for got it great well yes. if there are no other questions hari i wanted to thank you again i know it's dinner time uh, in no 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 problem Uh, really an incredible yeah. talk and thank you for sharing your um massive experience like stuff yeah um, i also want to uh make a plug for um ahari's senior partner dr sabapathy who will be giving us a talk on wednesday morning same yes. time at 7:30 yes. discussing the ganga hospital experience and replantation uh so anyone is interested in that that'll be wednesday morning the link has already been sent out um and also uh, professor jp hong our good friend from uh, seoul will will be giving a talk uh today at 5 p.m. Uh, on lymphedema. Whoever is interested, please join us for that as well. Hari, right, thanks again. Uh, great Thank seeing you. Thanks, Thank you. And I look forward Thank to seeing you in person. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Hari. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye.